Hey guys, it's Mr. Nolan. We're back with your 8D notes. I'm sorry you had to put up with mopey Mr. Grimsland there on B and C, but it's back to my turn here. So we're going to take a couple of minutes and we're going to look at contributions that we get from Muslim civilization, Islamic society during the medieval time period. Remember in these units, just like with the Byzantine Empire and when we move into feudalism next, we're talking about the time period between the years 600 and 1000. Really, we're talking about what's known as the Dark Ages. I'm doing air quotes right now. Dark Ages in Eastern Europe, or in Western Europe. Okay, it's the time period after the fall of Rome and before we get back to the Renaissance. Okay, so that gap space there. All right, so a couple of important Muslim contributions that you need to know about, and one that is particularly relevant when it comes to um, our modern day issues, or some of them, is one of the most important Muslim contributions is this building right here, this giant gold dome. This is known as the Dome of the Rock. It's located in Jerusalem, okay? It is a mosque that is built around the rock from which Muhammad is believed to have ascended into heaven. It's a very, very beautiful building, very typical of Muslim art, okay? Um, and many Muslims go there. And while on the surface that would not seem like an issue, but the issue is the other thing that is on that site. The remains of Solomon's temple, which we've talked about before, is known as the Wailing Wall, which is a sacred site for Hebrews and Christians. Obviously, it's also a sacred site for the Muslims who believe Solomon is part of their heritage as well. That's why that the Dome of the Rock is there. The issue is that there is disagreement occasionally between the Israelis and the Palestinians over having access to these um, to these sites. All right, so that's one of the big Muslim contributions in architecture. So that goes in your architecture box, the Dome of the Rock. Um, and even more specifically, just in general, an architectural achievement are domes. Now, we talked about domes also being a Byzantine achievement. They kind of come to them at the same time. So from both the Byzantines and the Muslims, we are going to get domes. Um, from both of them, we are going to get a similar art form, mosaics. The difference is what the mosaics were of. The Byzantines were a Christian empire, so those mosaics were generally depicting religious figures, so saints, Jesus, and so on and so forth. Muslims, on the other hand, their mosaics, as you can see here, are going to be more geometric in design. And part of that is that Muslims believe that art should not contain the human form or the form of any living animal. The Muslims believe that only Allah can produce something as beautiful as a human, so they should never try to. So Islamic art will typically be very geometric. It will be shapes, um, but we will not see human form in Muslim art. All right, um, the Arabic alphabet is one of their big contributions. The Arabic language is going to spread rapidly, 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 rapidly throughout a significant chunk of the world. It is still one of the most used languages. Like, I mean, if you want the three languages you need to know to really function in the business world are English, Arabic, and um, Mandarin Chinese. Th those are the three languages that are probably the most predominantly used in the quote-unquote modern civilized world. So the Arabic alphabet is going to originate um, during the time of Muhammad um, in the early Muslim empire, and it's going to spread throughout the Muslim empire and become the predominant language in the Middle East, um, in Eastern Asia, or Western Asia, I'm sorry, the Middle East, Western Asia, and North Africa. Um, Scholarship, contributions we're going to have from the Muslims and scholarship, is they develop these things that they call their houses of knowledge, which become the foundations for early universities. Um, and the work that is done in these houses of knowledge is they translate Greco-Roman work into Arabic. So they take the works of Ptolemy, the teachings of Socrates, of Plato, of Aristotle. They take these guys' works and they translate them from Greek, from, from Italian, and they preserve them in Arabic because they want their students to study them, so they translate them into their language. That makes sense, just like we want you 
to study things, we translate it from Arabic into English. Okay? So they translate these things into Arabic. And I've said before, guys, that one of the main themes to all of the stuff that we study in the third quarter is the idea of the preservation of Greco-Roman knowledge. Okay? With the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, the West is going to enter the Dark Ages. That's our next unit, feudal Europe. Okay? The West is going to enter dark, the Dark Ages. So this knowledge, this Greco-Roman knowledge is lost in Western Europe for a thousand years and it's rediscovered in the Renaissance. So we're going to talk about the places that it's preserved. The Byzantines were one of the first places where it's going to be preserved in Byzantine libraries. The Muslims are going to take it and preserve it as well. They translate it into Arabic. It gets stored in their houses of knowledge. That's how a lot of it will eventually be rediscovered in the Renaissance. Okay, moving on. Math. Okay, math. They're going to adopt what are known as Arabic numerals from India, and they bring the concept of zero west. Remember, we talked about the Gupta Indias. The Gupta Indians during the late Roman Empire had figured out the concept of the number zero. Okay, they hadn't really spread it a whole lot, but they had figured it out. Muslims will actually bring that concept west into Europe, and they come up with what we know as Arabic numerals which, as you can see in that chart here, are the numbers that we write with today for the most part. They are modern descendants of Arabic numerals that are developed during the height of the Abbasid Caliphate. All right? And the other big math concept is the development of something known as algebra, which said in the English version is the terror that most of you know as Mr. Nolan can't spell, is the terror that most of you know as algebra. Wow. Board not working very well right now. All right. So most of what we know from algebra comes from the Muslims during their height under the Abbasid Caliphate. Okay, so algebra is developed, a lot of the ideas, the equations, the proofs, the things that you guys are doing in your math classes, or some of you who took it did last year then, that is stuff that was developed by the Muslims, okay? Uh, we have an expansion of geographic knowledge. They come up with better maps. Um, we've talked about the spread of Islam is partially spread by trade, um, merchants, carrying things over long distances will spread Islam along with them. To travel long distances, you have to have accurate maps. Um, you have to learn how to navigate by stars. They have become very good at this as a people. Um, better maps, good ways of calculating distances. And then they learn how to use the stars to tell them what direction things are. Because, again, one of the five pillars of Muslim faith is that you have to pray five times a day facing Mecca. So from any place in the world, a Muslim who's traveling would need to know which direction Mecca is. So they become very, very good with geography. Uh, medicine. Medicine takes a lot of advances, huge advances under the Muslim empire. Um, they create tests for doctors who pass before treating people. So we go beyond what the Romans and the Byzantines do of training the doctors, now we create tests that they have to pass at the end before we let them actually treat people. I, I know this seems like common sense to you guys, but it's a big thing at the time. Um, they develop encyclopedias on drugs, write descriptions of diseases. Gosh, you would think when I borrow slides from the internet they could spell right. All right. Um, start their first pharmacy school. Pharmacy school. So like Rite Aid, right? Or um, Walgreens, the, the, the part in the back where they learn how to make different medicines. So we start to have our first foundations of way to um, treat d diseases. Um, they find out how to diagnose and treat the deadly disease known as smallpox. So the Muslims come up with a cure for it. Um, unfortunately, that cure did not get sent with the Europeans when they came to America the first time. And smallpox devastates the Native American population a thousand years later. So those are some achievements that we have in medicine under the Muslims. Um, and then here in a little more detail, if you want it, our QR codes that again would cover all of those. Let me move this off of there so you can get to that code. So you can pause this video here and scan any of those QR codes that you want. If not, 
That is entirely up to you. And that is all for me for this unit. I will see you guys in Unit 9.